We're live, Sarah Davis. <laughs> good to be here. Good to have you back. <laughs> I had the good fortune of talking to you, God, it must be a year and a half ago now on yeah. a former podcast that I had and it was just before you were off to embark on what sounded like the most ridiculous, ridiculously hard and ridiculously dangerous thing I'd heard for a woman in particular to do but you were aiming to be the first woman to to paddle the Nile and while this podcast is predominantly about me it is also about business and pioneers and and so when I ran into you again the other day in Bondi I thought it was such a great opportunity to hear about how it went and some of the challenges uh, around that because some of them sound truly dangerous so I'm assuming there's going to be a bunch of people that that haven't heard your story so can we go back right to the beginning because you're a corporate woman professional doing well living this you know enviable life in in Bondi and and you would have thought life is good but then it didn't seem to be enough so can I start with that and just hand to you where this crazy idea came from and and then how it all led to to the execution yeah absolutely um well yeah like you said it was it was kind of like living the dream in, in Bondi and had you know, a job that I really enjoyed. I was at Macquarie Bank. Um, for me, it was the best employer I'd ever had. I really enjoyed it there. But, you know, it was just that looking for more and more fulfillment that I knew, like, the standard corporate world wasn't going to give me. That just doesn't, you know, while I enjoy it and, I, you know, I, I like to do well at work, it's, it's, it's not, that's not where I get my sort of real fulfillment and achievement from. And... You know, it's that feeling of wanting to do more, see more, experience more. And it's just, it's hard to be what you can't see. And mm. I think that's what, you know, and I've been looking for it for so long and I'd, I'd had four years out as a personal trainer again, trying to sort of find different ways to to sort of get what it what it was I was looking for. And I just I just decided, it was just back in 2016, to really take stock and go, look, Let's see what, what am I going to do? What do I want to do? And I read this book by Daniel Laporte called The Design Map, which is sort of looks into how do you want to feel and then what makes you feel like that. And around this same time, I saw and, and read about a couple of people who'd done some expeditions and firsts, not in their natural sports, and they weren't your kind of like the Bear Grylls, you you know, those explorers or military types have been doing it since they were a kid. And, and suddenly it's like, well, I could sort of see what I wanted to be. And it's like, that's what I want to do. You know, I want to go on on a big adventure, an expedition and, uh, you know, and something that's a first. So so I, I got real goosebumps today and it was a real sort of light bulb moment. And I started looking, it's like, well, what am I going to do? And, and kayaking was my, you know, surf ski paddling was the sport that I loved at the time. So I'm like, well, I really want to do something kayaking and long story short, you know, a bit of Googling and, and looking and I came up with the, with the idea of doing an expedition down the Nile, um, which I was super excited about for a lot of reasons, but one, you know, I love Africa and I've done a lot of trips there. Mm. So the idea of doing something there while incredibly challenging, um, it, yeah, I was just super excited about it. Excited and reality are two different things though, <laughs> you know, yeah. and Bondi to Rwanda <laughs> is a, a, a really it's a long, jump. It's, it's a bit of a jump. So the, you worked in risk, so maybe that's a good start. Yeah. The, the preparation, because I think again, people, your story's inspiring, you know, and no doubt it's inspired mm -hmm. probably hundreds of thousands of people right now. But I think a lot of people lose sight of whether it's great business people, great sports people, musicians, politicians, whatever it happens to be, of the sheer hard work and sacrifice mm -hmm. that goes into getting just to the starting line. You know, I want to talk about what happened after that. But from the time you came up with the idea through to when you actually put the first paddle into the water in, in, in the Nile, what did you have to do? How much preparation? How much money? All of those things that I think people will find really interesting. Yeah, it was it was a long journey. That was, you know, it was sort of like the the coming up with the idea was great. It was all exciting. And then it was the reality of like, well, how on earth do I pull this off? Because I've never done anything like this. So it was a lot of research, a lot of talking to people. Um, 
and finding out, well, what is involved and, okay, so there's logistics and how long is it going to take and what equipment do I need, what craft, what's the water going to be like, what's the temperature going to be like and then really digging into all the risk, the whole risk management side of it, which is kind of fun because having done risk management for years in in banking, it was great to suddenly be able to apply and it's the same principles, apply Mm. it to this and you know, as well as being vital for this trip to work out, well, what's worst case? And there are a lot of worst cases. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I had something, I was looking at the spreadsheet the other day, it was something like 120 different risks, five categories, uh, so looking at illness and injury, stuff going wrong with key equipment, um, hostile situations, run-ins with animals, um, and then the environment, whether it's the rapids and, and so on. So that also identified some knowledge gaps or skills gaps. So then it really sort of helped me with some of the preparation. Mm. Um, It also helped get some of the fears into perspective as well because there was a lot I was scared of, but it was kind of like that, you know, I think your fears can be reality plus a whole bunch of assumptions. And by going through this process, it just helped me take some of those assumptions out. But then there were other situations that I went into the swift water rescue technician course because we were going to be dealing in some, you know, some pretty big Mm. water. And I discovered a whole bunch of risks I didn't know were there and it was just like, oh, wow, this is even scarier than I thought. Yeah. Um, But then I also also did some recce. So I went before fully committing because obviously this was was huge. I already had a trip planned to Namibia and I tagged on a trip up to Uganda to go and do some whitewater kayaking and to just have a look at the river and talk to people there and I came away from that, you know, 100% committed, but sort of terrified at the same time. So it was a case of, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this, but also creating a lot of sort of community accountability and basically tell everyone I was doing it. So mm. I couldn't, or I was less likely to back down, you know, without a really good reason. Um, so that, and then I also went to Sudan and Egypt on a separate recce to go and meet with government officials and embassy um, officials and paddlers because I knew I really wanted to have local people with me mm. and uh, and so I got to meet some some of the local paddlers and people who then did actually join the expedition and, and also helped me enormously with the with some of the organizing um, and logistics uh, so yes there was a lot to it and building all the social media and the brand and the website and then trying to get sponsorship you know which was really it's it's really hard mm. uh, you know there's a lot of people competing out there for it. And I think, you know, the, the money for this kind of thing is is sort of is few and far between, and particularly when you haven't got a track record in doing this. You can't say, well, I've done this, this and this. Um, but, you know, thankfully did get a few sponsors on board uh, from Shore and Partners Wealth Management and um, a lot of equipment suppliers from, you know, gave me my like white water rescue equipment uh, and, Paddles and camping equipment from Kathmandu, Bennett Paddles, mm. um, big water rescue equipment. So some great people came on and, and did support me, which also gave me enough confidence to sort of keep going, but did end up having to to sort of pay for most of it myself. And a lot of friends came on and helped. Um, I set up, because I've never been married, so I set up a gift registry because I thought, well, I've bought a lot of <laughs> gift <laughs> registries over the year. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe, you know, because it's nice to see where your money's going, to just sort of give... 50 or 100 bucks. You yeah. just go, well, it's just going to go into this pit of like nothing. Or it's like, well, I could go and buy the stove or the sleeping mat. <laughs> so I saw this gift registry and people did buy stuff off there. And and then if I needed to, you know, I had some spare money or something or I had the urge to do some shopping, well, I just go on my gift registry and buy stuff. Oh, I hope you got more than <laughs> all the people at my wedding because they're a little bit stingy, I've got to oh, tell you. No. Yeah. Well, I didn't have a registry. I thought I'll just go on the honour system. <laughs> And the honour system <laughs> was, work. I'm going to eat your food and drink your beer and wine <laughs> and, say thank and dance you. to your DJ. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a complete <laughs> other story. Net-net, though, given the opportunity cost and the investment net of what you got from sponsors and things, how much did it cost you? I haven't actually done. I should. I should. I haven't done the full tally, which I should do because I've just done my tax return and, I, and I've got that for the last couple of years. It would have been quite quite a lot because it was a, you know, there were there were services I was also paying for. You know, in the background, I I engaged a company to provide someone to check in with each day, who also gave me intelligence reports each day. 
they were doing checks on my like cyber checks on my social media to see if there were any dodgies, no dodgies following me. Wow. Yeah, and then keeping an eye on some of the chat rooms and and dark web and things for people talking about my expedition and and things did come up and and I tell you what, having that Dave um to to talk to every day and to help with things was was huge but you know all of this stuff costs obviously costs money but it was it was an investment worth definitely worth, worth doing. having yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah no doubt it, on that front was there anything that materialized that that worried you at all or that that they actually had to act on from Did the intelligence had, yeah we had um there was someone in Uganda who had form for kidnapping who was talking about me not in a threatening way but the fact that he, you know, he'd done time um, and knew about me and what I was doing. I was about to go through where he lived. Was just a being aware uh, and and just taking precautions. And there were a few in in Sudan which we sort of just keeping an eye out. And then so it was a case of doing things like social media posts were always delayed by a little bit. So because people would know where I'm going, like there's no surprise I'm going mm. down the Nile. Um, what we tried to put the element of surprise was sort of the when. Yeah. And, you know, making it really clear that I had people with me and that I wasn't a soft target um, and so on. And we, oh, there was there was one guy who I got this message through my Facebook page. It was just a hi. And it looked like one of the names I'd been told to sort of keep an eye out for. So I, I ran it past Dave and he sort of spoke to the the team and came back and said, oh, I think it was, he was a Libyan militia rebel. Um, but what worried me was he had was known to have some extremist friends through Sudan and Egypt and and he knew about me and he came, he was actually in Khartoum just after I left. And that, I have to say, that one, that did spook me a little bit, just sort of knowing that, you know, where I was going was some very, very remote places. Mm. And and it was a situation, you know, if if someone had really wanted to kidnap me for, you know, for whatever purpose, kidnap for ransom or whatever. Um, they could have done it. It, was, it wouldn't have been that difficult. But I mean, I knew that as a risk going in, I'd done hostile environment awareness training. It was a risk that I'd very clearly accepted when was just doing everything I could to mitigate it mm. and have, you know, as much as you can sort of plans in place of how to deal with it if it comes up. How big was your team most of the time? The team with you, not the, the support with, Yeah, around. so, you know, through through the rafting sections, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, um, three rafting guides, three Ugandan rafting guides with me. In Sudan, it was um, one paddler. So we split it into sort of two. The first section was a shorter one from Kosti to Khartoum, and I had one paddler and two people on like, ground support, one of which is sort of swapped in as well with one of the paddlers. And then for the really big section through um, going up through to the north of Sudan, one paddler and a support boat with two two people in there. And I, I kind of really wanted to go self-supported for that, for that section, but... Um, it was it was nice to have the support there, and then it was good. Like through Egypt, it was just me and another paddler. So then it was finally like really getting to do it with you know all the kit on the yeah. on the kayaks and and self supported through through that. And did you sleep every night tents, or did you have some housing accommodation too? There was some housing accommodation to begin with. It was it was all camping as we went further north through Uganda some guest houses uh, and then one really cool experience. We we came into this village and, and each village has, uh, in Uganda, has a chairman and you have to go and check in with a chairman when you're visiting. He's basically sort of someone who helps out with a bit of law and order and help and yeah. putting initiatives into the village and he very kindly invited us into his home for the night, fed us, gave us which would have been their beds, you know, put all the best linen on there, really looked after us. Um, but it was hilarious. His, it must be it was his granddaughter, and I don't think she'd seen white people before. Or she had not very much because she took one look at me and just bawled her little eyes out and covered her eyes in that kind of if I can't see you, you can't see me way. It was so funny. She was embarrassed or she was frightened? She was or? terrified, absolutely terrified. And he wow. brought her over to sort of closer to me and she had a, her little hands pressed into her eyes and as he got closer, you know, he pulled her hand away and she just screamed and cried and pulled her hand away and just ran away. Um, so I really felt for it. I was like trying to like smile, but no, nah, she no, was having good. none of it. Mm. I don't know, maybe she thought I was a ghost or something, but it was just such an amazing experience. And it really mm. helped by, I think, by being 
with the three Ugandan guys. You know, it's, you sort of get treated a little bit potentially differently, you know, welcomed in more as opposed to sort of being this big group of, yeah. of sort of foreigners coming through. It's not to say they wouldn't have welcomed you in mm. the same way, but um, it made for a, for a much richer experience, I felt. And then through Sudan it was a lot of camping and it was it was amazing. Like, you know, you literally just pull up on a sand bank as we went north, sandy banks um, or islands and camp, get a fire going, cook dinner. Uh, and that sort of continued up to the beginning section of Egypt and then the, the the authorities, the police really wanted me staying in hotels. They weren't comfortable with me with me camping. Um, they because just, of people or animals? People. people. They just, they're just very, very protect. You know, they rely so heavily on tourism and obviously they've had some pretty big hits there and there have been terrorist attacks and tourists killed and, you know, some of the larger ones really have to, hit it really did hit their tourism hard so they go to great lengths to protect tourists and keep mm. them safe so I kind of I think at times I sort of felt like traveling royalty because I had a police escort everywhere I went like on the water they'd be on a boat next to me um and when we got off the water you know get a taxi but then there'd be a police car up front and sometimes a police van behind you know it was just crazy how much have you videoed <laughs> Um, a reasonable amount. I had hoped to like get a really great, you know, a lot of footage, but it that went out of the window pretty quickly when it was kind of like trying to just get to the end of the day still Stay alive. alive. <laughs> I can <laughs> get it. Was like, and the thought of going, okay, let's stop here. Let's try and get um, some footage here. Could you film me here? And, and hang on a second. No, we just wait for that hippo to go. <laughs> Impossible. Nah, forget Real it. life. Like, Real yeah. life. So I did some blogging, like some video blogging, just for m- as much for me to remember, remember exactly what I was going through and – I think we can very quickly forget how painful things were, and even now, you know, I've gone back recently and looked at some videos, and I was like, "Oh, yeah, I was, I was okay through that section." And then I see my comments are going, "No, it was, it was hurting, and I was tired, and I was in pain." Yeah, how did the body stand up? Pretty well, surprisingly yeah. well. No um, big injuries. No, no. My by the end, my back was a bit strained, but that was it. Um, I, I'd gone, I went into it with. Uh, I think what do they call it severe tendinopathy or something in my shoulder but it didn't feel severe and and I had enough time to let that settle down um I'd had some tendonitis through my right hand but I had like thankfully my my sponsor gave me two paddles so one with a, a slightly smaller blade so mm. it just took all the pressure off my my arm on my wrist and yeah I didn't have any any injuries amazing um, yeah which was yeah so lucky yeah I know resilience is a big part of the message that you're teaching, imparting, and I think it's so relevant to Australian farmers at the moment. Like they've been through this horrendous period of prolonged drought Mm -hmm. followed by floods and then drought again and all of the pressures from offshore demands. And it's, it's, it's really difficult in our industry at the moment. I'd love you to talk a little bit about some of the really big challenges that that you faced the you know and the couple that I've read about were the hippo mm. the the one where you skip south sudan um the eddy and then the the police <laughs> talk us it's through a couple of them and, yeah. and whether there was ever a time when you thought you know what this is too risky or and and the hippo one in particular like I almost had a heart attack just reading it but <laughs> why don't we start <laughs> okay. there because not many people get away from hippos. No, and they, and you know, I can see why. I really can, having experienced it up close. Um, How it was, big are they? Oh, they're, they're massive. Yeah, they are. They are huge, and they are quick, and they are angry. They are some very angry vegetarians. <laughs> All vegetarians are angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Case in this point. point. And it. if I was eating steak, he would have given you <laughs> a hug. Fine. You know? Exactly. <laughs> what happened like, though, mate. in all seriousness? Uh, yeah. So we it was literally it was the fir- day six on the expedition, right? Our first day in hippo territory. So we'd woken up and heard hippo outside making its way upstream. So they get out at night and graze because they're being the size and they have to eat a lot. And then they get into the river uh, during the day and, and kind of sleep and go underwater and they, they can stay underwater for like five minutes at a time and they go and find their spot and off they go. So it was we were a little bit tense getting on the water knowing that this was it, but we we went around the first few and it was it was fine. It's generally, if you, you you see where they are and you can avoid them. I mean, it was a little bit harder because the, the river here was relatively narrow. It was mm. only it would be less than 100 metres 
um, probably more like 70 metres. So you haven't got Is a lot of- Is that close? It's pretty close. Yeah. And they can move fast. Um, but so then we were going along and, and we'd also seen a few crocs as well. So it's our first croc sightings. And I didn't know it's like what constitutes a big croc, you know, seeing them, the boys were like, yeah, those are big. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I stopped putting our hands in the water now then. <laughs> were they seriously big from? <laughs> they look pretty yeah. large. Yeah, I think they could have done a bit of damage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then we were going along and we saw this baby pop up and it was like, oh, okay. Literally, before I could even get the words out of where's mum, she was actually quite a relatively long way away, enough for us to actually go between her and the baby. And mm. if there is one rule of dealing with hippos, it is do not go between a mother and baby. So she lost it. She totally lost it and came at us. Um, Paola was at the back of the raft, jumped to the front. We had Koa on the oars and Peter at the front with me paddling. So we're desperately trying to get away. Do they go faster than you can paddle? Yeah, because it, they, they, uh, they're they on the bottom of the water. I mean, they can't, without their feet touching the bottom of the water, they, I don't, they don't swim, swim that, that fast. fast. Yeah. But with the feet on the bottom of the water, they can move pretty quick. So she caught up with us. I didn't see it, but the the boy said she she put her head under and tried to flip us. But you've got three people, um, all our equipment, all the bar- food barrels, frame, oars, blah, blah, blah. She couldn't. So she sort of stopped, thought about it, came again. And, and I just felt this tug and and looked around and there was this huge hippo basically she bitten into the back of the raft she was she was coming for us right um and luckily she let go and kind of backed up whether i don't know like the the air coming out might have startled her she realized she was now quite a long way away from her baby she yeah. sort of backed off a bit which we were able to then get to the river bank get out and when we realised, okay, she wasn't coming at us again, then unload um, the raft and luckily there were some locals there who helped us pull the raft up um, and it was thankfully the, the way it's inflated, it's in sections so mm. that it wasn't like the whole thing went down, it was just a section went down and we had all the stuff we needed to repair it so the boys then spent like an hour or two then patching it, like really thoroughly patching it back up and then we had to think about our approach going forward because you know, we knew this was likely, it was, certainly wasn't going to be the last hippo we saw and if this is what we were potentially up against, we had to sort of rethink what we were going to do. How keen were you to get back in the water? I was terrified, absolutely yeah. terrified. Like at the time, I think, you know, when you're in that total, you know, fighting for your life kind of sort of situation, you, there isn't space for fear. Mm. But then having seen up close what they were capable of, um, it with the thought of getting back on that, I was so scared. And I found out afterwards that one of the boys was really close to tapping out. But he was the one that came up with the idea and said, okay. A, a local guy? Or? Yeah, a Ugand, one of the, yeah, yeah, one of the Uganda boys was already to – to tell so like this is it's just not worth it. You gotta worry when the locals <laughs> are tapping know, out. This is it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, he God. didn't tell me this till afterwards, but he um yeah, he came up with the idea of like, okay, next time we see a hippo, assuming we can get off, we get off the raft, we wait, we watch, and we tow the raft past so that we've got, you know, a nice big buffer that we're not right up close to the mm. to the hippo. And we, we put that into practice within another hour of being on the water. So we come around the corner and there's this huge male hippo and he put on this psychotic display. I've never seen like opening and closing his mouth, jump, jumping up and down. And you see this like this huge thing jumping up and down and then scattering um, shit out of and with his tail. So it just like went everywhere. And it was just like it was full on. And we just had to stand there and watch and watch and wait until he calmed down and then very gradually just lead the raft past and then get back on. But, you know, every time it's that you're getting back on, you know, is it going to charge us? Is it going to come for us? Where's the next one? It was it was pretty full on and it I let it get, like, worrying me all the time and I had to sort of give myself a bit of a talking to her. So, like, Sarah, you've, you've accepted this risk. Stressing about it is not going to make the hippos go away it's not going to change how you're at you 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 know you're not going to be in as good a space to react if you're mm. you know exhausted from from worrying about it all the time so i just really had to kind of talk myself down off the edge and just go just accept this and get on with it and we'll deal with it when it happens had you done or got any training um before you left to deal with a situation like that like if you really are feeling anxious this is what you should do or you were just doing it from all your competitive stuff and pretty much that yeah. you know and the risk management side of things and 
you know, I don't think there was any one thing in particular, but I'd done so much sort of research of whether it's watching documentaries or reading about people who've really pushed themselves or been in extreme situations because I felt like I, I don't always deal with that real acute stress situation. Mm. Don't always deal with that. Well, actually one thing that did help, there was um, a TEDx talk I saw and the guy was talking about, you know, it's reframing how we see a situation as whether it's a threat or a challenge. And that really, that did help and it's helped me in a lot of situations since because it's so, you know, if you're it's a threat, you're stressed, you're on the back for it. Yeah. If it's challenge, it's like, right, game on, let's do this. Mm. And, you know, you're, you're there, you're in more of an attacking mode, less stress. And and I just try to use that, you know, going through the rapids. It's like, all right, this is a challenge, adventure. Come on, let's do I'm it. I'm not <laughs> sure Hippo has anything but risk. Like threat. there's no challenge. <laughs> the challenge is to live. Surviving. That's it. Exactly. Just live. <laughs> Yeah, damn. Um, the Eddie, I'm sure. Oh, and she, I, know, I need to ask, how do you sleep on a night after that? Like I'm assuming you're having to camp where you were with where the hippos were or were you able to sleep in a house? No, we were we were camping. Where we could, We because they get out and, and um, graze at night, if we could, we would put some ropes around us to just keep them away. Um, but we <laughs> – it's strange. It does work. Really? Right? They don't, it's like the shark nets at Bondo. I go, ah, I don't buy that shit. I'm like <laughs> – <laughs> but they do. They've got quite sensitive skin, apparently. So it did keep them. Really? It kept them away. But we, I think we, we woke up one time and you could hear them crunching fairly nearby. And it's like, Mika, I won't be getting out of my tent tonight. That's for sure. How much did you sleep? A lot, or was it s- hard to sleep a lot? I slept relatively well. I mean, there were times I was stressed, and and I did have some emergency sleeping pills with me, which because I needed to be rested. You know, you've mm. got to and body recovering and things. Of so course. worst case, I would do with that. But um. I went through times. I'm not the greatest sleeper at the best of times, so it kind of, yeah, I just added to it. <laughs> Particularly when you're just about to go to sleep and you can hear them outside. You're like, oh, you're kidding me. Really? Yeah, really? <laughs> no, I'm not sure I would be sleeping at all. What were you eating? Um, for that section, we taken – it was actually – it was one of the many things that was stressing me before I got started was I've got, you know, there's four of us. I've got to have enough food potentially for three weeks we, we, you know, we knew we'd probably get resupply points, but I, I couldn't rely on it. Um, I had to have, make sure that it was enough, so otherwise I was going to have a mutiny in my hands. Yeah. And then it's coming up with things that are going to last. You know, it's not going to go off. It's got enough calories in there. There's some mixed nutrients uh, and it's easy to cook. So there was a lot of pasta and rice and, and couscous and pesto but you know what i what i missed was was i couldn't get any you know getting the protein and getting meat like i just nice you just couldn't out there. there were no nice juicy steaks <laughs> like where's big meat i need could have killed a hippo <laughs> barbecue that fucker happily. would have been tough meat i guess so. <laughs> yeah. pasture fed and everything that would have been tasty <laughs> yeah. So largely just things with unlimited shelf life and yep. high nutrients or yeah, sorry, as much sorry, as high pro- energy. High and, energy. Yeah. So I'd worked out, you know, I'd looked at, okay, well, if we need this many calories, how mm. can we get that many calories? Lots of peanut butter, Nutella, um, breakfast was, oats. That worked really well. And I've, I've used it all the way through the expedition. Oats, Nutella, peanut butter, you just get, you know, some... High energy, low, low, um, slow release energy, yeah. some fats, a bit of protein in there, maybe Easy. a scoop of protein powder. Um, so, yeah, so that worked well. And eating a lot of crap, like there was yeah. a lot of biscuits. I've, I don't think I've had a biscuit since. I never no. thought I'd out, I'd never want to eat another Oreo. I really don't want to eat another no, Oreo. No one should eat another <laughs> Oreo. Listen up, people. Oreos are off. <laughs> Have you had a good steak since you got back? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Where'd you go? Where's your favorite place? Um, I tend to cook them at home, so yeah, yeah I'll buy it and and I had one the other night and oh man, it was good. Nice. It was good. Yeah, we'll send you up to Victor Churchill after this and <laughs> they'll, they'll get you some real steak. <laughs> I do want to talk about the what happened with the Eddy too, because that sounded quite frightening. Also, just it's and right. assume that all of us are are not familiar with what rapids, actually happens. Yeah. yeah, rapids and serious rapids. So the way we said it, I mean, one of the reasons why, there are a few reasons why we've gone in a raft for this section. One, because of the wildlife and two, because I don't have experience in big white water to be able to kayak it. So we had the raft and then we also had a kayak, which we put on the back of it. And and Co was our safety kayaker who would get out as we approached any rapids to go and scout them and check, like, is there a line? Can we run it? Or do we need to portage and go around? Um, and... 
you, we it was a while before we actually got to to any rapids and and I was like looking almost looking forward to it despite this being one of my big fears yeah and so we were we'd gone through a couple of sections where there'd been some reasonable white water so it's it's graded from a um, one to six one to five runnable six generally you've got to be a pro pr- pretty much yeah, pro. yeah. you're not going to do commercial very rarely you're going to do any co- kind of commercial trips down down mm. that and we in this particular day we'd we'd had to portage so we'd gone came up to some some rapids and kind of checked it out and it's like nah it's not runnable and it was a real punish trying to find somewhere to get off there was thick papyrus and it took ages because you've got to unload everything like everything strapped on so you've got three food barrels another barrel with electrical gear or like camping gear the kayak blah 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 blah, blah. it's just it takes forever we got that going again and we came up to another set of rapids and we we kind of went in not expecting it to be as bad as it was and because you, as you're coming up you can usually see like some the water bubbling up and you can hear it mm. um you know my stomach sometimes would just drop once i just start I to imagine. hear that thunder and you're like oh no here we go again and um so we, we stopped in an eddy and which is where, so you've got an island. So behind the island, the water's not running. It's like still water. So it's a spot you can just wait there while Kaya went off and had a look. <laughs> We're waiting there. Freaking hippo pops up. And normally they don't stay in the in the rapids because it's obviously hard work to stay there. And it's like, you are kidding me. So you had to move. So we had to move a little bit, but not too far away. Kaya comes back and says, look, those two channels over there, uh-uh, you, you can't, we can't run those. The channel to the left what we could see looked runnable and we couldn't portage because it was we, where we were. It was so thick. The, um, the, all the plants and the papyrus next to the river, you couldn't have got off, particularly with all our, our gear. So we decided we'd, we'd run this section and, um, and we're going along and I just had this, my logic said, if this, if it's unrunnable, those two channels, there's going to be a big drop or something. It's going to be, it's not going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, unfortunately, right. I was right. We came around the corner and there was just all this water gushing over this drop and it was a big drop. Um, I showed the video to someone when I was back in Uganda who's a really like one of the head rafting guys and, and his wife said he looked at that and was just like, oh, no. How <laughs> was big was shot. the drop? I don't, it didn't, when I've looked at it since, it didn't look that big. It was more the volume of water going over it. Yeah. Um, we tried to get into an eddy, but we couldn't. We literally just got sucked sucked over. And I was trying to look for an exit to run out the back of the rock, which was a deeply, deeply floor plan, which Koa cut short screaming at me, Sarah, get down. Like you were going to jump off was, the back of the rock <laughs> and just let you. It was, I was just looking at that. Was was this an option at that time? Yeah, and, get it. And Koa quickly says, no, no, don't. So I literally, as we're going vertical over <laughs> this draw I'm getting down into the bottom of the raft and and hanging on and Co said we, we pretty much went vertical as we hit the bottom we went under briefly and I could feel the the the, the raft must have buckled like the weight of all the gear is you know yeah. it hits the bottom and the back and I could feel one of the um food barrels like on my head and then luckily we we popped up we didn't we didn't get flipped which is a miracle one of the boys, uh, Peter, who was on the oars, he did get thrown out. So then I was trying to like get a throw bag, like the bag with a rope in it to him. But Paolo's telling me like get down just before a tree nearly takes my head off. And just careering through because it's just like we don't know what's coming up ahead. That could be the warm up. You know, we just didn't we didn't yeah. know. Luckily it did flatten out. We got Peter, we got him in. And after that, we were on such a high because we just run this ridiculous rapid. And survived. And survived it. Koa came around the corner. He could not believe that we were one, all three of us there, and that the raft was upright and we were all okay. And Didn't lose anything? The only thing we lost was a Ugandan flag. So we'd had the Aussie flag and the Ugandan flag at the front. The Aussie one survived, but the Ugandan one didn't. We'd lost a couple of things which we picked up, but one we lost one of the paddles four days later. Paolo's on the oars and he looks ahead and he's like just floating just in floating the- ahead of us he's like there's our paddle and that particular day we'd we'd heard we knew that we were coming into hippo territory and and we were all pretty stressed and that was just like for me it was this omen of like we got the paddle it's going to be fine we're not going to get killed by how hippo far today. into the trip was it um that was uh, probably a couple of weeks in okay so we'd already, early. We'd ha- it was so early and, we, and in between that we had the getting um, detained and arrested in Burundi. So in the space of two weeks, two, three weeks, it was just ridiculous. And and this was like you were planning 10 months, yeah? 
Oh, yeah, sort of worst nine, case. Nine, nine, yeah, nine, nine ten, ten months. months. Yeah, so you're case. two weeks in. <laughs> You've been arrested. You've almost died twice. <laughs> almost lost your head. And you might think going, I'm not a very good manager. I'm not doing this for 10 months. Like, <laughs> just. I, I, and there was, there was a time, like, particularly after the, the whole Burundi thing, that I did question, like, it was more from an, I wanted to keep going, but it was just like external perception is would people be thinking like, wow, this is She's a really mad. dumb, not just yeah. so mad, it's like that's dumb to keep going. It's dangerous. But yeah. it was just, oh, it was very difficult to have perspective or objective, which I had issues with, you know, along the, the whole thing. And that was sort of one of them. And I was like, no, I'm going to keep going. And because I had Dave who I was checking in with and he's got so much experience of dealing with expeditions and was able to just give me that support I need. It's like, no, you know, you're doing okay. You're yeah. doing well. You never had a moment where you thought enough is enough? No. 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 That's pretty amazing, Sarah. I probably should really. have done. <laughs> yeah, no, well, yes I made or it. no. I think, you know, again, like a farmer as an example, yeah. like they don't have the the option of saying. Well, they don't have I, an option of, of They literally saying, don't have you know. an option, you know. it's it's We've got to just get through this, yeah. which how long were you locked up for? Oh, I mean, it was we were under house arrest, so it was we were put in a hotel, which I had to pay for, which I thought was a bit cheeky, but a bit m- infinitely better than the prisons there. Uh, it was just a, f- a few days that we were there for, but you just we didn't know what was going. On. I actually found the whole thing quite exciting, but I think that's because I completely underestimated the seriousness mm. of the situation. Um, so there was a, there was a few chats going on in the background. I just it was it was a sort of accident that we'd gone across the border. We had basically been tricked across the border by some guy and then dobbed into the army. So it's just like you just look at it logically and go, how can you do anything other than release us? Yeah. But a lot of the time logic doesn't always play into to the factors there. So, yeah. um, so yeah, it was an interesting little side trip and I had a Burundi ticked off the list of countries <laughs> unexpectedly. <laughs> you couldn't go to South Sudan. No. Which... which precluded you from being the first is that right well it's what it ended i mean I've, it became like the first woman to lead an expedition down the nile but for a complete source to sea navigation you know women have paddled you know, big sections um, but yeah. it, this was going to be the first sort of a complete one and early on in the trip and even in before i got going like the the whole first thing became secondary you know that's quite ego led mm. and i knew that yeah um and the why behind, and I had to keep coming back to this, like the why behind it had to be stronger than just being a first. Like I, it wouldn't have been enough to go through all of this um, and even just to get to the start, I think, just on this sort of first basis. So, yeah. What I, was it? Describe why you did it. Like I know you alluded to before a sense of purpose and things, but what was it in your deep heart of hearts? What was the, the, the real burning reason inside of you? I think it's just this... this constant curiosity I've had and this is sort of probably what I've come back to afterwards that I've realized I've always wanted to to challenge myself see what I'm capable of to do different things to have a life less ordinary and it was just and it just this was for me this was the answer and and I wanted that adventure and and challenge and it was it was still ticking all those boxes and that that sort of fulfillment and it just, I came alive. I really, you know, as tough as it was mm. and as challenging as it was, friends of mine said it to me, you know, one of my best mates, Sue, I spoke to her and, and we'd FaceTime and she's like, you've just come alive. Mm. This just lights you up. And it really did for all the, as I say, for all the challenges, it just felt so right. Yeah. It's interesting because a lot of people say, you know, we've got so many problems with mental health and obesity and, you know, you name it, we've got it at the moment as a, a, in Western society that we need something really hard, whether it's a war or a deep economic recession to, to give people back that sense of community and fighting together because everything is too easy and is too ego driven. So, Oh, massive. And you get perspective back. You get a whole new perspective. Yeah. I think when you go and do something like this and you go to those sorts of countries as well. Mm. Are you a fundamentally different person? I don't think so. No. Same, think just so. resilient, I think more, more resilient? I think more resilient. Yeah. Um, you know, you learn, you know, obviously a lot of outside of comfort zone stuff and, and you grow and I think, you know, I'm st- it'll take a while to really, you know, appreciate exactly where that is. You know, it's not like I've suddenly woken up and gone, oh, I feel completely, i completely different. But mm. um, you know, there, there were things I came away from, like with a huge sense of, of 
gratitude. Like to be able to go and do something like this is an enormous privilege. Mm. Um, and like I said, the sort of the perspective I got on life of the things that you kind of used to think that mattered and, and get caught up in suddenly – I was at my happiest living, you know, there was a time because there were some quite big breaks in between sections to organise bits or wait for things to to come together. And, you know, the time I was living in this hot room above an office, this tiny room that I was sharing with a rat that would come out at night and, mm. and I could hear him like snuffling away trying to get my food and things and I had, you know, minimal clothes and stuff there. And I, you know, I've never been, I've never felt happier or more content as I did at that, that time. And yes, it's, you know, I... I acknowledge that I was doing that at a choice and if I want to, you know, tap back into my, you know, as I have done my very comfortable life here back in, in Australia, I, yeah. I can and a lot of people don't have that ability to just go, okay, yeah, you know, I've done like the hard stuff and, mm. and I want to go back to the easy life. You know, you see people who don't have that. Mm. But I think some people do, you know, obviously not as extreme as what you've done, but they do big things. They go on adventures and they either come back and say, I love my life and that was way too mm. hard or they come back and say this default life that I've created for myself is never going to sustain me. I need to now find a way to continually do the other thing, whether it's full time or it's a big part of, of what they're doing. Where do you fall in that spectrum? Uh, yeah, wanting to go on and do more of this life of, uh, you know, adventuring and and going and doing and seeing more and not, I, I don't want to go back to sort of the, the, the Monday the to life. Friday. The Monday to Friday, no, yeah. no. Do you think there's a way to tie in, you know, a bit like what Red Bull, and I saw you did an interview with Red Bull, which was great, like what Dr. Andy Walsh from Red Bull does with corporates and they do it with their athletes too where they take these people and take them out into the the wild mm. and completely take their control away from them. There's probably an opportunity for you to do stuff mm. like that for executives and teams that are really looking for something that you can't get at, you know, a day at the park high. At, yeah, which would be great, would be fun to do, you know, to bring in, particularly having done like the corporate stuff for so long, you know, mm. it would be it would be interesting to to do that kind of work and, and give people those experiences and, and open their eyes up to different things and what they're capable of. Mm. Did any demons come out? Um, no, actually, I mean, from a from a mental state, mm. it was actually, I was a little bit worried going into it. You know, I've, I've battled my own demons in, in the past and thought this, wasn't sure whether this was potentially something that would, would bring those, bring those out. Um, and there are a few things that worried me on top of that, you know, that whole idea of being with people all the time. I'm, I very much need a lot of my own space and I'm used to having that. And suddenly I was going to be with people 24 seven and not only that, but people I don't know. Mm. Uh, and I, when I realized that that was going to be the situation, I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be tough. How'd you find it? It was actually a lot better than I expected. Do you, the sort of you, particularly being with people who, who they, you know, between themselves, they speak their own language. So I kind of had my own space. Um, and that was, it was a lot better and easier to deal with than I, than I thought it was going to be. And, and I think I was just so distracted by all the things going on. There were constantly, you know, challenges and problems to solve. And, but then also this amazing experience, you know, like suddenly you're, you're paddling. I mean, I loved it through the Sudan. You're going through the Sahara, like the world's biggest hot desert, but you're mm. paddling through it on a river and this spectacular scenery. And all these people who, you know, are cheering you on or giving you the thumbs up, everyone wanting to host you and look after you, like these amazing, amazing experiences and every day filled with them and random experiences. It's like there wasn't the space to ruminate or, or you know, stress beyond, you know, what was there for the for the expedition. So I was I was in the best state I've been in for a, that long a period of time. Yeah, and did you have any... I suppose light bulb moments when you looked at how they looked after nature and how they lived in, I suppose, concert with nature versus how us with all our luxury and all of our creature comforts and things, but with a massive dislocation to natural systems, was it obvious to you or was it just, I'm in a different country, I'm in a different place and they do what they do and we do what we do? I, mean, I think you sort of appreciate how you 
much closer to the whole situation they are. So if it's, you know, they the the meat that they're eating, they've they you know, they've got the cow and they slaughter the cow or they you know, they buy the they've got the goats and they sell them to the local butcher, you know, so it's it's all a lot smaller. It isn't on on that mass scale. It's mm. it's yeah, it's it's a different, very, very different um approach there. You know, everyone's growing a lot of their own things. So they're a lot more self a lot of the time a lot more self it's just sustaining, particularly in Uganda, as you go up through Sudan, you know, it was a, a very different situation there. Um, but probably what struck me there more than anything was just the kindness and the hospitality. If literally, you could, we could have been hosted every night and fed. You know, one night we, because oh, I wanted to experience it. And so we, we pulled up and we were invited to someone's house. So there were four of us. We were given beds. They put the beds outside. We were given food. I was taken into the room with the women and one of the women's there with a pretty much newborn baby and got to talk. Luckily, one of the women there did speak some English and, yeah, they, you know, fed us and, you know, like, no, have more, have more, have more. And the next morning got us tea and coffee and mm. and we were on our way. And th- th- they just look at us, well, that's what we do. I mean, wh- wh- it was almost like, well, what else would we do? Of course we're going to do that. Incredible. It's what a- do they eat? Um, they eat a lot. They eat a lot of meat in through Sudan. It was there. With there was a lot more meat eaten through Uganda. There wasn't that much, and because it wasn't it, available, it's not as available. And it's expensive, really mm. expensive for them. Um, so you, if you did have some meat, it would literally be a few chunks. Whereas you go up into Sudan, and you know we'd we'd go and you'd have some bread and loads of just plate of meat uh, and dips and things. It was so good. It, it was really, really, really good. So I was like getting all my protein back in. I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> Obviously, it's been such such a success for you, but I want to dive into some of the themes around it. Like you came back, you're alive, you're in one piece. That's, I think, tick. that's the yeah, <laughs> one massive tick. What are some of the other metrics that you've used to say this was an outrageous success for me? When I was, you know, looking back at the kind of when I added up the distances done, because I'd had to do sections by other forms of transport for various reasons or, you know, had to skip South Sudan because it was just going to be too dangerous, I'd lost that perspective objective of what had been accomplished. And Mm. when I look back at it and... And sort of looked at, yeah, the kind of distances done and that just sort of keeping going through it all. Um, I was I was really pleased actually, you know, with how it turned out given everything that, that happened. Um, I mean, I was happy just to, to be honest, just to get to that start line. Yeah. For me that day when the paddles hit the water, it, because it had been so tough, even when I flew out to Uganda, which is where I sort of based myself from before going to Rwanda, I still didn't have the team as much as I tried everything to get a team. I had a potential rafting guide. I still didn't have the approval. So it was just massive leap of faith. Well, it's full of self-doubts. And, you know, luckily it all came together quite quickly and we got to the to the source and that, you know, that day the paddles hit the water. It's like, wow, If even if it finishes today, it's enough. Mm, incredible. And anything after that was a bonus, which I think also helped frame things as things, you know, plans change and yeah. plans had to be compromised and and so on because how long was it was it 18 months or two years the the lead up uh, so good to 18 months to two years from when i really years. kind of okay let's let's do this 18 months and then from the start of the paddle to the end how long was six it six months six, six months. months but but as i say there were there were breaks in there at various sections to stop and plan and get approvals get and everything and- get arrested and get unarrested <laughs> <laughs> What about the whole like, you know, you you're fast training, working, you know, seem to be a, a very type A personality. Did you find that you were able to just stop a little bit because you had nothing else to do? Yes, because I had I I didn't have a choice. And the first time it really after things we got into a bit of a routine when we got to Tanzania, and it was just long slow days and you know less drama happening. And at first I found that quite tough. It was the monotony and the boredom, which I I was expecting it to be an issue, but actually gave into it relatively quickly. Um, and through Tanzania, like I didn't have a SIM card there, so it was like none of the old social media and things like mm. that. And and actually just got a lot better, particularly like paddling through Sudan. We just got into this really good routine of paddle for two or three hours, stop half an hour, paddle two or three hours, stop half an hour and 
repeat and camp and that was it. And I just have music in or listen to some podcasts or nothing at all and just just be in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I've never been, I'm not very good, you know, being present and just that kind of calm. And it was, it really helped me just slow down and appreciate things. And, you know, it's that stop and smell the roses and I didn't have a choice to do anything but that. So it was, it was really nice, really, really nice to have, because we don't, I don't know, we don't often give ourselves that break. We, we overload ourselves. We're busy, busy, busy Constantly. all the time. We, you know, yeah. you never have that. You might have those moments, you know, a bit of meditation or go and, go and do a yoga class and go, right, that's it, done. That's it. Okay, Bang. I my for it, so let's go, 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 go. What's a to-do list? And, yeah, suddenly I didn't have any of that. I was like, oh, okay. And it was good. I yeah. recommend it. <laughs> Classic. And have you brought some of that philosophy back with you or are you back to type A? <laughs> a little bit of time. I did stop and meditate today because my mind was just spinning. Because like, oh, you had a spare 20 control. minutes. <laughs> no, I was just like, because I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to write the book and get the speaking going and plan the next expedition and then trying to help a group in Uganda get some drowning yeah. prevention programs going. So I'm... I've done what I was doing and, you know, and also then my training and build, rebuilding the body after, you know, it had a bit of a got smash pretty bad during mm. that. Well, I didn't have any injuries, you know, there's a bit of rebuilding to be done. So I am back to being fairly busy, but just making sure I do get those, those times out and that time to meditate. But Are you a big believer in meditation? Yeah, I do. I don't do it enough. I think we're, most of us would probably say that. Yeah, but we recently did really it. Helped. We did. We put a, a pilot group here through because we, it's a stressful industry yeah. that, you know, we deal with chefs that are absolutely wonderful, but they're under enormous stress and, you know, sometimes get very emotional about it. And so we put a, I think it was 13 of us that did it. And it's been transformational for people. You know, they're doing it twice a day. How long for each session? 20 minutes. minutes. So they did the Vedic TM course and I I believed in it, but I have seen some transformations here that I've never seen in people before. Wow. Yeah, some really tightly bound human beings Mm. that are now, whoa, who's that person? You know, so yeah, we're going to roll it out across the the whole organization. Um, I'm super curious, Sarah, about your views on... Wellness in general, like obviously it goes without saying you're incredibly fit, but wellness more specifically and your philosophies around food. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, sport and health and wellness has been a big part, has has always been part of my life really. Um, You know, and I did have four years out as a personal trainer. I really went and followed the the passion and and now I have to to balance it between getting, for me – overly competitive and pushing myself too hard and expecting too much um, and being kind to the body and, and being, you know, grateful for what this body has enabled me to do mm. and making sure, you know, I look after it with a good, healthy diet, you know, nothing too extreme. It's just trying to feed it. I mean, I go off, I'm a, I had way too much ice cream at the weekend, but I love ice cream, right? <laughs> we got to do that stuff. So... It, if I want to, you know, for me, it's if I want to do all the things I want to do, I have to have a well looked after and healthy body. And, you know, and there are things I've got which I can't do anything about, like arthritis in my hip and I've blown my meniscus. You know, I've, I've learned the hard way yeah. what not to do and just try and be a little bit smarter about it. But, um, yeah, for me, it's I'm 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 happiest when I'm when my body's feeling good and I'm eating healthily. I feel so much better. Eating healthy though for you is what? Is it just whole food diet or is it more of a paleo diet? Is it a more of a traditional diet? It's a pretty, um, you know, it's I, yeah. I have carbs. I'm not paleo. I I tried. I did a little bit. Although I say I don't do extreme, I did do keto briefly because my carb intake got out of control because mm. I've been eating so many biscuits and all this sugary stuff. I uh, couldn't on the stop. Trip? Yeah, on so the trip. So you did a keto diet when you got just back, after, or during? Just after. After there after. was no opportunity to do it during. Yeah. Just to reset, and then it just got my carb cravings under control. So now it's, you know, whether it's oats for breakfast, and I, I do supplement with protein powders and things, and mm. and. I have the protein bars just because it makes me feel like I'm having a chalky bar and it just helps keeps me on the on the straight and narrow. It's yeah. vegetables and chicken for lunch or something like that and meat and vegetables in the evening. Sometimes vegetarian, you know, I don't always, always and have meat, meat but yeah. I do it's have. a good approach, yeah. Yeah, just mix it up. 
And and who recommend doing a keto to reset? No one did. No I just one. Decided just your to just own Doctor Google. I knew, yeah, exactly. We're just like I need to do <laughs> did something. Did you feel different? Well, the thing is, I'm all or nothing. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not very good at moderation. Yeah, that's a good and thing. So you know? that's, that's just, overrated. It's, <laughs> it's so overrated. <laughs> Glad you I've never met a super interesting <laughs> moderate person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't so I just but I knew like keto for for me is not going to be a long term solution. I don't I know for my body it's I, I need the carbs, I need that and and I, you know I'm sure it works for a lot of people, but yeah. for me it wasn't going to be that long term goal. It was it was just about getting doing a bit of a reset and mm. and I think for me it was also going to put another too much if I did it for too long another stress on my body like my body being under stress and doing you know mm. I'm guessing with quite high cortisol levels from the physical and mental stress through the expedition. Yeah. Um, it was certainly showing the signs of that with having lost a lot of muscle uh, and putting on fat. And, you know, I was expecting to come off the end of this trip slightly emaciated, yeah. which I was kind of looking forward to, and it was quite the opposite. And I was like, are you kidding me? I've just paddled like thousands of kilometres <laughs> and my clothes are tighter. How is that possible? But I think, you know. There you go. <laughs> Every female listening to this is going, fuck that. That was the only reason I was going to do it. That was a good it. thing. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, don't do it. Oh, and girls. I think also, you know, the – it was difficult to get that good balanced diet that would have probably helped prevent a lot of that as well. You know, having yeah. loads of sugar and things. Is not, but it is. But it's, it's all your inflammatory markers yes. and things. Yeah, your Everything body goes up, into which, fight or flight. Yeah. It does think it's yeah. probably thought at times it was going to starve to death. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, it was, you know, my body adapts really well. I'm, Adrenal I'm, overload yes. from yeah. the hippos and, yeah. It was all of that. So. I can only imagine. <laughs> Where can people find you and what's next? Like how how do you turn this dream of it not just being an expedition and taking short breaks from a corporate mm-hmm. life but turn it into something that is your mainstream career? Look, I'm still working out how that how that looks. I've got the next expedition, um, I wouldn't say plan, but I'm well on the on the way. So I want to do the aim, the long term aim is to try and do a source to see river descent on each continent. One of the major rivers, maybe not the biggest, but one of the major ones. So the next up's going to be the Murray here in Australia because I even... That's a good story. Yeah, because I just really wanted to do something locally for the next expedition and to actually go and do the Murray here will be will be a great a great experience, infinitely easier to organise. I'll mm. probably get too, too, compliant, I'm too complacent about the whole thing and, and it will all go wrong. But, yeah, that's I'm hoping to do December, January of... Um, this year and into next oh, year. Oh, coming soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah wow. coming up really soon. Um, and and from there, you know, what life looks like, as I said, you know, I'm I'm getting into the speaking side of things. I still haven't worked out exactly what life's going to look like mm. yet. Um, I've got some ideas of, you know, I'd like to be doing, you know, risk management, but possibly in some slightly different environments and slightly you know, whether it's more politically unstable areas or stuff like that, you know, I, I, I do like that. <laughs> <laughs> Britain, there's a couple of crackers, you know. Okay, one of the people, maybe hostile, that's because they're hostile, they probably would, they would fit that basket yeah, You get shot well over there too, you know, 252 <laughs> mass shootings this year. Like how more hostile do you, do you want? want? Anyway, know. let's not talk that's about another, America. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's, there's plans, plans coming and some of them are still coming to fruition. And the website's Paddle the Nile? It's Paddle the Nile. Dot um, com dot paddle, au? Or no, just dot com. Paddle com. the dot com. And then I'm also trans, I'm just sort of building f- for the future expedition, Sarah Davis dot co. So that will be what I'll then transition to. Okay. Um, yeah, and the all the social media is still Paddle the Nile. Yeah. I'll transfer that across at some point. But while I've still got, you know, planning on the, the book, which I'm writing at the moment, it's sort of going between mm. the two sort of brands as it as it were. Yeah, have you got and a title? Is it going to be Paddle the Nile? The it book? will probably be Paddle the Nile, I think, because yeah. I've got the everything set up. Everyone's it's easy and it kind of sums it up quite nicely. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a, it's such a great story. I'm super glad that you're back. And um, Thank you. I hope you That's never good. have to see a hippo again. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for coming on, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers, My pleasure. Paul. Cheers.